Yeah. The floor is yours. I, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll make sure that it's on, on screen in a moment. Okay. okay. Yeah. Tov, I was asked to speak in English, my mama notion, um, <laughs> and um, uh, just to word, this, this article that I hope you've had the chance to read um, is appeared here in, just very briefly, in a, a journal which is worth knowing, Religion and Society. Okay. Um, they're around now for about, uh, well, almost 10 years. And um, uh, I and a colleague were asked to put together a special issue that came out of a conference a session that we had um, relating to the Holy Lands and, con and focusing on um, uh, the interface between religion and politics in pilgrimage or pilgrimage-like uh, performances. So that, uh, then we had the, the, we gathered together a group of five articles, one on tips and commissions, one on a seminar that was done around the empty tomb of Jesus for a, by Eke, by Eke Homo for a, uh, a ca mostly Catholic ministers, one article on um, performances in the, uh, in Ir David of, uh, by, by El Ad uh, personnel, uh, one was done on olive picking uh, in the Palestinian territories, one on the image of the child either as uh, innocent or as feral Arab uh, by uh, pilgrims going to the West Bank. Um, and then um, these, five of, these five articles were put together and I was asked to do an introduction. I sent in a small introduction and the response was, that's not enough, give us this large overview. And that was, that's what produced this, this article that served as the introduction that, that I had you read. Um, what I'll do today is this. Um, rather than to, to go over, I'll, I'll try to not to overlap too much what I've said here in the article, because if I've written it, I don't need to say it again. But rather to, because this is an introductory article, to give some um, perhaps illustrations um, to some of the, to the themes that um, I touched on in the article, mainly from uh, my own uh, experience uh, and field work. My own experience means that I, I've been, I worked as a guide, I made my living as a guide almost entirely for Christian pilgrims to the Holy Land for 20 years. So much of the material that I've been writing about and that's in this book that Effie mentioned that I'll pass around is based on, on my own work and my own work experience, supplemented by um, interviews um, with uh, other tour guides, mainly Jewish-Israeli tour guides, some tour leaders, some Palestinian tour agents uh, that make up the material that goes into, into this book. Uh, and then in addition, we did a small project, um, less than what we hoped for, along with uh, Professor Yvonne Friedman of Barilan, on um, Catholic guides to the Holy Land that offer a perspective that um, is in many ways different from my own experience, which was not entirely, but mostly with Western Protestants. Right? Although some German Catholics, uh, so. okay. And um, then when I'm, when I'll try to keep it reasonably short, and then what I'd like to do is um, to do a kind, like you have with the, um, uh, when you go now into a YouTube or other article, you get a commercial for, you know, an advertisement that comes on for 10 seconds. So that before we move to the um, questions, is to just make you familiar and pass around very briefly just some books that I picked off my shelf that have to do with anthropological approaches to pilgrimage and that I think touch on issues that have been relevant to this to the seminar, and then go go into to questions. Okay. Um, okay. One of the an older map that's on, that's reproduced for the use of pilgrims and religious tourists coming to the Holy Land. I'll come back to this later, but note pilgrimage and religious tourism and my combination or blurring of the two categories um, is, is deliberate. 
and I would argue that today it, it's practically impossible to distinguish between between these two terms. But I'll continue. Okay. Well. There are many definitions of pilgrimage, and certainly one of the most influential in anthropology uh, to, to, to date is that that was formulated by uh, Victor Turner in the book by Victor Turner and his wife um, Edith Turner. She, Victor Turner, Zalvet Tiba, Edith Shetiba, Del Chayim Aukim. Um, in 1978, and here are two definitions from the Turners, and both of them overlap, and they um, uh, provide a wide screen for at least for the article. The first is um, some deliberate, for, some form of deliberate travel to a far place, intimately associated with the deepest, more cherished, axiomatic values of the traveler. Um, the book that spurred, uh, um, or the article that spurred this book of the Turners um, was called The Center Out There, The Pilgrim's Goal. And in that book, what Turner, when the first, the article, Religion, 1973, um, uh, Turner spoke of the notion of a sacred center not being in the center of society, a kind of cosmic Eliadin center, but rather drawing on his work uh, among um, tribal r rites of passage. He showed that the place and time where the significant rites um, took place was not in the middle of the village, but outside in the bush on the edge of the community. And um, Turner's model for society um, was that one does not become a full human simply through reproducing the codes, norms, and social structures that one has inherited growing up in the village. Okay? Rather, um, in order for a person to realize his full humanity, one has to leave home. The ceremony takes place not in the center of the village, but outside of the village. And so by being outside the center out there, the statuses that we carry with us in the village life are annulled, or at least suspended for a certain time. People can meet each other and under conditions of communitas, the idea of a kind of existential equality that takes place, that cannot take place in the village, but that can take place outside on the edge. Um, uh, the removal of clothes or the wearing of, of the same clothes, um, uh, the common diet or common fasting, sometimes um, uh, bodily uh, discomforts or even the border of, 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 uh, of torture, um, that level down <clears throat> people, that level the social differences between people and enable people to go into, say, from the village to the place of the right of passage outside and then come back to the village with a new status. So in the case of age ceremonies, they leave as boys, uh, girls different, use different ceremonies, and they, they come back as men and women once having gone through this leveling process. And the leveling process, he says, this communitas teaches people that they belong to something that's larger than their status. They belong to something that is meant to symbolize uh, humanity or a larger community that they feel they belong to. So in this sense, the creation of social solidarity is not simply a reproduction of social lines, but a way of leaving the center to go out somewhere to voyage and then to come back changed. And only through that departure and coming back can this sense of belonging to something bigger take place. Now this is a model that Turner took from the tribal rights and then applied to various areas, including in the article in 73 and later in 78 and 84, to pilgrimage. Right? And uh, he and his wife, Edith Turner, um, uh, together wrote a book on Christian pilgrimage, and this definition comes from, from there. Note that among the things that are in this definition are axiomatic values of the traveler, but not God, not miracles, not religious experience. And this makes it a definition which can be applied equally well to certain <coughs> kinds of not secular travel as well as to religious pilgrimage. 
The second definition written by Edith Turner a little bit later that appears in the, the last edition of Eliada's Encyclopedia of Religions, uh, a religious believer in any culture may sometimes look beyond the local temple, church, or shrine, feel the call of some distant holy place renowned for miracles and the revivification of faith, and resolve to journey there. Now, it would be interesting if we were to hear textual scholars to compare these two mm -hmm. definitions, both of them written, at least one co-written with Victor Turner, one written by Edith Turner, who is very much more, exper more experientially into the religious experience and committed to mystical experience than mm. I would say than Victor Turner was. Mm. Um, but rather than to look at the differences, what I want to point out here is that um, this is a very off-center way of writing a definition. It doesn't say pilgrimage is, but starts out a religious believer may sometimes look or does. It's a, an action-based kind of in media res, in the media in the action where the things take place in the performance, rather than saying pilgrimage is and defining it. And notice what she says here that. Um, the local temple on the one hand, church, shrine, and rather feel the call of some distant holy place. So that um, pilgrimage is here defined as something that is not local, as something that requires a, a pull from a distance, a sp what Preston calls spiritual magnetism as if the place itself exerts something that detaches the person from the orbit of their normal life, right, and brings them to something that goes beyond it. It's not the local temple, the local synagogue, and so on. And there, processes take place, again, here, Vic, uh, Edith Turner writes them in more religiously specific terms, miracles and revivification of faith, rather than the previous definition, axiomatic values of the traveler. But in any case, there is this um, attraction of distance, the road, the voyage that needs to take place in order for this to happen. Now, um, I would, uh, in at least, I would argue that this voyage is essential, and we can find what I'll do today is to provide some evidence from of some of these themes from various points in the work. Here is a definition, not definition. It's a description that comes from uh, Philo of Alexandria, so first century. And he writes, again, excuse the translation that I'll depart from, right? Um, uh, he does not permit, he speaks in here about, he starts out with really with talking about the temple. And he says the first temple, the, mo the first temple is the entire universe. And he goes on a bit about that. And then he said, but besides that, there's a specific temple built by human hands that's there in Jerusalem. And then he writes about it as follows. He does not permit those who desire to perform sacrifices in their own houses to do so. But he orders all men to rise up, even from the furthest boundaries of the earth, and to come to this temple, the second temple in Jerusalem, by which command he is at the same time testing their dispositions, so the difficulties on the way that are part of the pilgrimage, uh, most severely. For he who was not about to offer sacrifice in a pure and holy spirit would never endure to quit his country and his friends and relations and emigrate into a distant land. Leave the emigrate for a moment, it may be translation. But the idea being that one of the uh, stages of pilgrimage requires a detachment from home which is spiritual as well as physical. It means leaving something behind it may, in order to go out and to endure the dangers of the road. Then, I continue, Sorry for the, if it's not readable, but for innumerable companies of men from a countless varieties of, variety of cities, some by land, some by sea, from east and from west, from the north and from the south, came to the temple at every festival, as if to some common refuge and safe asylum from the troubles of this most busy and painful life, seeking to find tranquility and to procure a remission of 
and respite from those cares by which from their earliest infancy they had been hampered and weighed down. Okay? So the idea is in, in other translations it's translated as a haven or a port. The idea is that they're the storms of life and then one leaves the storms of life in order to go on the road towards pilgrimage. You leave things behind you, and in, if you, in, in the testament, for example, of Paula of the 5th century, right? 4th fourth, fourth. Fourth century, she it says the same thing. You know, I'm leaving my, I'm, she, you know, the, there we have the tearful departure from her children and waving on the boat, you know, as she goes off, leaving the things behind in order to come to another haven, something that that's different. So what I point out, it's in any case, it's very much a center out there. It's not replicating the home, right, that one has and finding it there in the temple in Jerusalem, but leaving the home behind in order to go somewhere else where one can find, enter into another reality. And so, I'm continuing, and so by getting breath, as it were, to pass a brief time in cheerful festivities, forming a friendship with those hitherto unknown, a combination of actions and a union of, of disposition, disposition so as to join, sorry it's cut off, but to give everyone the sense that we're all in one spirit. And then he writes about the libations that were and the offerings that were a case of it, that were an example of emotional exchange. So. The people come from their homes where they enjoy different statuses, speak different languages, belong to different communities, and then come together in a single place by detaching themselves from what home is. And in that center out there, which requires distance, requires an attraction, then one finds that one belongs to a larger community and food sacrifices, the standing before a greater power, before God in this case, all create a leveling of the differences between people that in the case of the second temple was reinforced through kinds of dress regulations, what one was allowed to wear and not to wear, leaving one's walking stick and on the outside and going in barefoot, through food regulations, notar meant that you had, there was an abundance of food that had to be either given away to people or burnt, um, purity regulations that were both enforced in one way and suspended in others, uh, the impurity of the Amha'aretz that was suspended on their holidays so that people could actually, who normally could not eat together at the same table, could do so and then have the sense that they all belong to a single community. Okay. Oops. Oh, something got erased. The old, I see the older version is still here. All right. Um, the themes that I want to address here um, are one is the, the notion of, of, of home. Okay? And even when pilgrims speak about the sacred center being a home, right? right? I dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Um, still, this home is very much recognized within the context as a home that's not really a home. It's not the same as home. For example, the very next verse says, right, to see the, right, the, I don't know. Bliss. Noam. Noam. The, what? How would you translate? Bliss. The bliss, thank you, of God. And to, let's say, visit in his, not well, visit in his sanctuary. And then the next verse says, He will uh, hide me in his tent, right, or his hut in the evil, in times of evil. So, and then, Yamideni al Sero, place me upon a rock. So it's not a home. And um, this took me a while because in my experience as a guide, I remember more than one time landing, a group would uh, land at Ben Gurion Airport. They would come out of the airport, get onto the bus. People who sometimes had made their way from Hawaii 24, 30 hours on the road would come on the bus and say, oh, I feel so much at home here. And I'd say, tell me, does your home, I didn't say, but I wanted to say, tell me, does your home look like an airport terminal or a tour bus? 
what is this home that one speaks of and that feeling at home that doesn't look anything like home? Do you live out of your suitcase and ask your guide for permission to go to the bathroom when you're at home? Right? Um, so I think that unlike at home, even when people talk about home, there is one of the some of the characteristics of pilgrimage are one its temporariness. When people stay long enough, they stop being pilgrims or stop referring to themselves as pilgrims. Um, there are a certain amount of, of dangers of the travel along the, home, the the road. So there is a kind of effort. There's very often, both in pilgrimage and in tourism, a semiotic mode, a reading of signs, which to me is one of the, um, the most unhomey things that one can do. Um, when one comes home, one doesn't have to interpret or read the signs that are there because being at home and being comfortable means there's the bed, there's the room, things are where I've left them and then not read them, whereas when one travels then these stones, rocks, places are all signs pointing to something else and need to be interpreted in pilgrimage as well as in tourism and this mode really um, places the pilgrim at a distance from what living at home is. Um, there are the communities that are different and in general much larger than those one associates with in general being at home and um, there are the contestations of within pilgrimage of place often among pilgrims and among sometimes among religions over shared or contested sacred sites um, there are what did I say? There are the um, narratives that accompany pilgrims as they go on their way and that are presented both by texts and by people, whether they be priests, guides, other uh, religious uh, or other authorities. Um, there are different kinds of materials that are there on pilgrimage, whether it be the relics that we've heard about um, just last, last session or uh, souvenirs. And there are a large number of different mediators with various um, roles and various positions of authority that um, both introduce or facilitate pilgrim experiences, getting them to places, making these things accessible, and at the same time that seal environmental bubbles around the pilgrim so that they avoid contact with other things that the religious authorities or others don't want pilgrims to see or be in touch with. And for, in my work as guide, one of the things that fascinated me is not only what people see, but even more what people overlook and how well people can overlook things that are right in front of their nose if their eyes are, say, just focused on Jesus and then what's there on ground level is different. And sometimes these looks are, are encouraged through practices that I'll refer to, one of them very prominently, the outlook, which has become part of the pilgrim repertoire, at least the Protestant repertoire and Zionist repertoire, it has spread from there onwards looking at things from above. And even in the tour bus, one more recently, uh, I think one of the things that changes experiences, tour buses for most pilgrims and tourists, at least in the Holy Land, are now over the last uh, 30 years are one meter higher from street level than they were. And that changes even the way people look out a window and what they see and from what, what, what distance. Okay. Um, I'm going to start here, let's see, um, with a word about um, a kind of the, the pilgrimage, and I say, is, is a kind, is a therapy of distance. It's not only a therapy of distance, it means that, as we heard in, in the last conferences, that many of the um, images and the experiences of, of pilgrims are already projected onto the place from images and practices that they bring with them from home. Okay. Um, uh, and um, 
These help people to cosmicize and in some ways to partially domesticate a space that is not home, that doesn't look anything really like home. So these images are important, and we heard about, I think, the images of, of practices, for example, of, of uh, doing the Via Dolorosa, going from one station to another in Christian Europe. Um, uh, and here I'll, I'll show this through two tours, that two kinds of tours that are uh, fairly recent. Um, they're both Christian pilgrimages, although they're not necessarily labeled as such. Um, but they include visits to pre-Christian holy sites, they include Bible readings, they include rituals. One of them I will call um, Biblical Israel tours, and these are Christian Zionist tours are close to them, and I'll contrast them with the images that are brought on what I'll call living stone tours or alternative tours that uh, are meant to show solidarity with Palestinian Christians or Palestinians. So. This is a tour called Tours Through the Book, and it focuses, I read it, giving an inside look on the land and people of the book through understanding of Jewish traditions and the observances that Jesus would have participated, grammatical errors in original, okay? We search the Hebrew roots of Christianity and the relevance of Israel today, okay? So for these Christian Zionist groups, Jews continue to be the, the people of the book, to be its kind of bearers of revelation, and um, the events that occur in modern Israel today are part of an end time scenario that very often lead to the second coming of Jesus, rebuilding of the temple, second coming of Jesus. And so um, they are, as Phaedra Shapiro wrote about these tours, she said, it's not so much about where Jesus was, but where Jesus will be. So uh, very often, so well, we'll see it in their, their programs and their itineraries. I should point out that um, there's a tendency to overemphasize the eschatological. It's not simply that they're going there to learn about Judaism because Jews are great cannon fodder for the apocalypse. Uh, it's also, in other words, there'll be a time where it'll come, 140, the rest of the Jews will all, except will all be, will be destroyed, except for the 144,000 righteous, the rapture will take place, most of the rest will convert to Christianity, and then Jesus will come again. That's one part of the picture. There's also a very uh, deep exploration of the Old Testament that they're more familiar with, the Hebrew Bible, and uh, even an adaptation of, in recent 20 years, of Jewish ritual uh, mm. by uh, evangelical groups, uh, Brazil and the United States and other places as a way of, of finding authenticity, uh, including such things as Jesus Bar Mitzvah, um, and so on. Um, Tell that to Oni Weinstein. Right, what? Tell that to Oni Weinstein. Well, <laughs> you know. <laughs> A, pre a preacher was crestfallen when I told him, you know, the bar mitzvah originated in medieval Germany as an imitation of the, of the Catholic communion. <laughs> okay, um, here you see one of their brochures. Okay, Zola's Holy Land Tours. I don't know how well you can see it. Look at the iconography of the tour. This is uh, um, somewhere on Mount Zion. You have here a menorah, which serves both as the symbol of the temple and as the symbol of the state of Israel. You have here your shepherd and wife, right? Here's Zola Levitt, a uh, um, Jew converted to evangelical Christianity and a, very, a major evangelical preacher with the outlook here that, that very Protestant and Zionist outlook over the uh, Mount, not only, but over the, from the Mount of Olives over the city. And again, Holy Land Tours. Here's another uh, quote from an itinerary there. We focus, uh, I read that? Yeah. Okay, down. Okay, here's another one. Full Faith Tours Israel, a Biblical Journey. And you see <coughs> that you have here the, um, uh, the Temple Mount as seen from the Kotel, the Menorah of the State, right opposite the Knesset, a scripture from Qumran, the one to the right of him, I'm not sure if he's an archaeologist or one of the people on Shabbat who had to leave the community uh, <laughs> um, for, to do his what need to be done, and then here the Sea of Galilee. Okay, All of them in nature, almost all, all in nature, no interior uh, uh, focus and very much an emphasis on this Jewish aspect, right, of claiming the land, the Israel biblical journey. Okay. 
from the brochures if you're praying for peace we believe that to be biblical we do not expect the situation to improve until the Messiah's return please do not make a reservation with us based on the hope of a calm future <laughs> so if you come to Israel and there's a time of war well you're part of the prophecy and the the next part says but our experienced guides will make sure you come back in peace okay. in peace and not in peace not in peace and not peace. <laughs> Go to the other, the, another tour. Again, all of these are Christian pilgrimages. They're not political solidarity tours, right? They're, they're, uh, their emphasis is on, say, on the holy sites or places of Jesus. Here we have, uh, sorry, this is still a biblical Israel tour. Uh, you head into Judea, visit the sound and light show at Kfar Etzion, the price Jews have paid to hold on to the country, driving past Bethlehem. So they won't visit Bethlehem. They won't go to the Church of Nativity. That's in the Palestinian Authority. If we need to go there, we, if we're going to go into Judea, we're going to go to the museum in Gush Etzion, and then we'll visit some of the residents of the old city of Hebron, walk to the ancient neighborhoods and museum. It's the museum of the Hebron settlers. Okay, and that's the, the emphasis here. Return to Jerusalem. Okay. Now here we go over now to the second port, second another side, which are these um, called Living Stones tours. Uh, here you see the focus, not Israel, but the Holy Land. Notice the picture. It's taken from where you have the uh, Church of the Redeemer and um, uh, what are we? The Church of Redeemer, basically, in the foreground. And then we have in the three insets uh, a pastor with a column, Mitri, Mitri Raheb, Lutheran pastor of Bethlehem. And then left and right we have emphasis of char tradition and charity, so the old woman in her traditional Palestinian uh, cross uh, cross stitch uh, dress and the two children uh, holding holding up a piece of white holding a piece of white bread. Okay, so charity. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. Here's another one of the brochures. Again, look at the composition and how it differed from the Kotel view that we saw earlier. Okay. So Dome of the Rock and in the background the Church of the Dormition. Living Stones, to generic name, founded to bring pilgrims and Middle Eastern Christians together in worship and understanding, not merely to gaze upon the stones, but to meet the living stones, Christians in the Holy Land. I won't go through the whole verses, but basically what they're saying, it's, it's picking up a verse in Corinthians saying, um, uh, Jesus is, right, these are, we are the people, we are the living stones, the living foundation, taking the verses from uh, Vaikra, from Leviticus, about a nation of pre, Mamlechet uh, Kohanim Vigoy Kadosh, a kingdom of priests in the holy nation, and saying, now this applies to the church. You're the living stones, that, again, and relate also to the true temple. So, visit the holy sites, walk where Jesus walked, bear witness to the realities of the occupation, military checkpoints, refugee camps. So these are framed not simply as touristic visits, but as act of bearing witness, right, to Christian solidarity uh, in the land. Um, here's another one from their pamphlets. Um, these are tour brochures that I'm quoting from. Do not, did not our hearts burn within us? Jesus going down the road on the way to Emmaus, right? The disciples don't recognize them. When they sit and they break bread together, their eyes were opened, and then one turns and said, didn't our hearts burn within us when he broke the bread? So by our having communion with Palestinian Christians, it's through that that Jesus reveals himself to us as, as a community. And then a continue afternoon, remembering that Jesus was a refugee, we'll visit Beth Bethlehem's Dehesha refugee camp. Right, dinner and so on. Okay. Now these are these different brochures then focus people's attention on different political realities, not simply as something that has to do with modern Israel or current day Palestine, but rather as things that can be read through a Christian perspective as bearing of witness, as solidarity with Israel, or as a witnessing to oppression and sharing one's bread with the with uh, with with the weak. So the, here, through these Christian tropes and images, these political events are then saturated with Christian significance. Now this is not only done through brochures, it's also done through the choice of um, sites in the area. So for example, after the separation wall was built, then um, very often uh, the pro 
let's say, the Christian Zionist groups would often photograph this, no longer there today, right? But peace be with you on the separation wall between Jerusalem and Bethlehem. And if they were taken to the um, separation wall, it would often be to, by guides, would often be to this point, where the area of, of near, near Gilo, where there was very clearly a separation between Israel or Jewish, Jewish residents on this side, Palestinians on the other side. On the other hand, the Livingstones tours, when they're taken to the separation wall, um, not only with different narratives, but different parts of the wall, such as this, where you can see that it's running through the middle of a Palestinian neighborhood, and therefore the separation and the difficulties of separation are made much more blatant. Or here to this icon, Our Lady of the, Our Lady of the Wall, um, which is um, uh, a place where on, uh, very often on, on, often on Fridays, it turns out, uh, groups, uh, Christian, but sometimes with Muslims as well, go on procession and have a procession here along the wall and see this as, you know, a sign of, of Christian suffering, right? Um, uh, a kind of Mato Dolorosa here, um, weeping over her children, right? Think of Rachel's tomb on one side and this on the other side. And even through souvenirs such as this one, this is the separation wall nativity set. Oh, wow. Right, wow. and uh, it actually comes in two models: uh, the more expensive one with a removable wall in case that should ever happen, <laughs> and in the Anglican church circles, particular, well, church Presbyterian Anglican church circles in England, um, the uh, they have developed an entire Christmas liturgy. Uh, for several weeks of the advent of Christmas that use these um, uh, separation, this separation nativity set and larger models within their church as a way of preparing people for Christmas. And thus, along with often Palestinian olive oil and other products that are sold at Christmas fairs and so on, so that there's an attempt to introduce solidarity with the Palestinian people as the main message of Christmas and that these um, souvenirs um, serve a very, um, in those cases, a very prominent ritual purpose within the church and not only as something you place on your shelf to, to show to your, your friends, friends and neighbors. So here we have the notion of how material and how material objects focus. These are not relics by any means. Um, but even though as souvenirs, they carry, out, carry over much of the, the weight of relics. And you can see that also when, when you go into, for example, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and you see how the, not this one, but the Orthodox handle souvenirs that they purchase of all kinds, where um, very often they will remove them from their shopping bags and you'll place them on the Stone of Unction, one at a time, you know, for each of them to be contacted with the Stone of the Unction before putting them into their shopping bags. I know in many cases of Western Catholic pilgrimages, what they do is the priest says, look, just line up all the suitcases at the airport, and you may see this at Ben Gurion, where the priest goes over sometimes even with water and sprinkles them on the line of suitcases because it's just too much trouble to bless each of these things individually. But people want them blessed, but so they say, okay, here, put your suitcases out there at the airport, and we'll bless them all. And now these are all blessed, and you can take them back with you, right? And these are done very often among the Orthodox within the shops. Um, they will say, now, look. These are not blessed yet. I can't do it. You can't do it. Make sure you give them to your, to the priest to bless before you take them back home. And I say, I asked them once, you know, do you ever sell for people who don't have time objects that are ready blessed? No, no, no. I can't do that. Those, those are blessed objects, right? So there is an entire economy and that functions differently among Protestants, uh, Catholics, and Orthodox, but. Um, the notion of, or Protestant pilgrims very often develop a discourse in which we don't have holy places. We just have a direct, you know, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Or, you know, look at all those pilgrims there. You see the Russian pilgrims, there's a kind of a drawing back of, you know, we're not pilgrims. No, 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 we're, we're Bible students, right? Of course, they don't want to be tourists either, or just plain tourists. 
so that this pil who is a pilgrim and who is a tourist I think who's are on the, seminar? What? And who's on seminar and who's on seminar or on Bible study seminar. these are categories that people work with and define in their own terms and uh, they're very often defined in relation and opposition to each other by people all the way along and when people try to separate analytically pilgrimage as opposed to tourism I, I don't buy it I think it doesn't work not only do they use much of the same infrastructure uh, as Simon Coleman writes, he says, um, a, even the casual tourist may find himself swept up emotionally at certain religious sites and become a pilgrim. And even the most devout pilgrim may rapidly become a disgruntled tourist when he's ripped off one too many times. So these things are very fluid. And how do we categorize people who go from the Holy Sepulcher to Masada, to the Dead Sea to rub themselves in mud and then come back in time for evening vespers. Do we say they stop being pilgrims and are now tourists when they go to the Dead Sea? And if they hold worship together at, as an evangelical groups do sometimes at Masada, are they no longer pilgrims? These have financial implications too. For example, the, the Israeli government allows pilgrim groups, those who have green cards that are um, sent, that are issued by the Christian Information Service or the Franciscans, to guide groups without a licensed guide that other groups are required to have. But the priests, the religious guides, green, or we call them green card guides, another kind of green card, um, are only allowed to guide at religious sites. Well, there, there are leaders who said, yes, but Masada is a religious site. It's from the time of Jesus. And, and how do these things negotiate? What counts as a religious site? If the people pray there together and even hold, a, supposing, a Jesus bar mitzvah service in, at the synagogue in Masada, uh, or I haven't in or in Mach well I haven't seen a bar mitzvah in Machane Yehuda but it's possible it's you know it's possible yeah. then do these places become religious sites Relig are there religious tourism as opposed to pilgrimage and likewise with materiality there is a whole um, uh, I would say sh uh, um, market of um, Judaica for Christians mm -hmm. right here, they, this is one of the prominent shops, the Jesus Boat Shop. And here you see, um, alongside the um, nativity sets, uh, Talitot. And you notice that I've never seen anyone in a, any synagogue wear a talit like the one on the left. And if I could, I can't do a close-up, but the, um, uh, the cloth, the, the ornament here on the back does not have as the blessing over the talit but rather um, a verse from, a prophetic verse from Isaiah, say as Isaiah 53 or so, right, pointing towards right, the future that was, that is seen by, by, by a Christian as being fulfilled through Christ, okay? And you have shofars with uh, silver ornamentation that I've, I've only seen Christians buy, mm -hmm. right? And you have here this yeah. kind of, if you like, Syncret, syncretic or, or fusion or messianic jewelry. So you have a Magin David with a cross, a fish with a Magin David, and this one that you see down here, right, that's called, there's a whole urban legend that developed around this called the messianic seal, supposedly found by some priest on Mount Zion and dating to the time of Jesus that combines the Menorah, the Magin David, and the fish, the, the primitive, primitive Christianity, you know, never mind when these, each of these symbols actually originate, but, um, and these are born and purchased, and there's quite a market among evan evangelical, particularly pilgrims. Okay. Um, okay, a little bit I talked about uh, here, um, these different narratives about materials, the role, role of mediators. Okay. Um, as I said, the mediator's job is to not only to bring people in contact with the sacra, but also to guard them from contract, contact with influences that they, they don't want or narratives that are, are external. And here I found, um, both through my own guiding and through the project I did with Yvonne Friedman on, on Catholic guides, that um, you know, Catholic guiding a very, uh, has one of its main origins in the Franciscan practices of the 13th or so, 14th centuries. 
And the Franciscans would, at the time, would welcome people, not only would take care of most of the land arrangements um, and hire a, 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 a Togeman or a, a in Latin, I don't know, but a, a, what, a translator and guide, uh, non-Christian usually, to take them off to place to place to handle money exchanges, negotiations with camel caravans and transport and so on. Uh, while the priest would, um, who came along with them, the Franciscan priest, or from here very often, would welcome them in Jaffa, uh, would arrange, would accompany them to Jerusalem, um, would give them the full list of indulgences and what they would earn, how much indulgence they would earn for e each religious ritual or, or visit, and also instruct them very much in the details of the rituals. Okay. Now, these things among the Franciscan guides, green card guides, and most of the large number of these groups that come only, as, if almost all Protestant groups have an Israeli or Palestinian guide in addition to their Christian spiritual leader with them. A large number of the Catholic groups, and I believe the majority of the Orthodox groups coming here today, um, go only with a spiritual guide. Okay, so and all, sometimes one living here, or sometimes one that comes with them. In this case, the group you'll see in a minute has two has has a local priest. It's a Spanish group, a very conservative Spanish order. Uh, Holden de la Virgen, or so, based in northern Spain. And here they hire, they take a guide who is a, a priest, not a monk in this case, who comes along with them. And their ways of using space and their ways of using ritual, um, I found perhaps not surprising, are very different from those, say, of the evangelical groups that I often, often observe. One is, here the priest takes them down to the baptism site on the Jordan River. Uh, one that is uh, preferred by the Catholic and Orthodox, whereas the Evangelicals prefer the site up by the Yaldenit up north, more theatrical and has better showers, uh, more uh, uh, and souvenir shops and so on. And um, here, uh, what he does is he takes some water with him and he sprinkles them with water that he says, I took this from 100 kilometers further up the Jordan because it's cleaner there. So he's baptizing, not baptizing, but he's sprinkling the water on them, but not from the river, but from somewhere else. And the people who came here within this group, who was with them for three or four days, there was not one map in the group, there was hardly ever a Bible being opened, and when the, the priest read to them, he would read from a guidebook in Spanish rather than from a copy of the bound book of the Bible. These things would be unthinkable for a Western Protestant group, for which their mode is different. So, and the people didn't know actually later that they were right across there was Jordan on the, there was an international border that Jordan was right on the other side it didn't matter because what took them through here you see the local priest right along with their the the um, the, the, the guide priest what takes them through the ritual the, through the the pilgrimage is the ritual and they can walk along here like on the Via Dolorosa in a procession sometimes even uh, you know, in the rain, umbrella, here you see a Greek, or in this case, picture doesn't match, it's Greek Orthodox, but, but in a procession, reading in a language that many of them don't know, where their vision is actually blocked by sometimes the rain above the, shoulder, the back of the person in front, the shoulders to the side of them, and then guarding their candle like this, and they've done it, and that's it and they'll go to the Holy Sepulchre and sometimes come back to the Holy Sepulchre three or four times for different rites in the course of the pilgrimage. And it's the rhythm of time, the, the, of the calendar or of the ritual, following Vespers, following morning, early, early morning matin prayers, that will take them through, through the pilgrimage. Right? Uh, here, this is the group itself that had a large number of religious, large of nuns that, that were with them. Contrast this with the use of space for an evangelical group, right? Okay, where you see this is on top of Mount Carmel. You see here, this was really a selling point for this group. They had the 10 foot map spread out so that everything could be indexed. We're going from here. Here's the mountain. Here's the valley. Why is it on the mountain? Which way is it down in the valley? And people would ask, so where did Elijah? take them down, the prophets of Baal, and why is it here? Couldn't it be the next one over? Do you see that river? Look over here, two fingers, a little bit to the right. Do you see that little squiggle by the bridge? There's the Kishon. Oh, okay. 
pictures of the Kishon, okay, from above. And all the time, while one's speaking, referencing, you see here the group leader, referencing the, the verses, right, holding that Bible open, very often a very dog-eared and marked up evangelical Bible to follow it. And you see here, okay, the priest going to various places and reading from it, and it's important that the Bible as a material object have weight, so it just, and people, some will, it's changing, but some will object to people reading, feel it's not the right thing if people are reading from a pad that they carry with them. But the book itself has weight for Protestants, right? And as a result, the practices say of the, because indexing and reading and reading in certain tones is so much a part of the pilgrimage, you can see this is me a long time ago, um, that reading the Bible for the guide and reading the Bible by the pastor very often overlap on the same ground, right? Which means that, ah, you know, one, okay, you need to, the guides here as mediators, it's very different than the dragoman, where his job was to, you know, get them from one place to the other, and the priest does the religious stuff. That division of authority is very clear among the Catholics, because whatever the guide, say a Jewish, Israeli, or Palestinian guide may do, right, what he will not do is this, right? sprinkling them with water from the Jordan, right? That's the ritual stuff, and that marks out the priest. Whereas here, right, you see the practices very much overlap, and they need to be negotiated. So what do you read, what do I, you know, what does the guide read, and when, and how do they explain? And at the same time, this confusion, because for, for evangelicals, when you talk the talk, you're walking the walk, then that means that the question that, that I would get as a guide and others, if you read in the same way, is, so when did you discover Jesus? Because if you're reading it empathetically, you must be one of us. Okay? And then that needs to be marked out. And very often the ways that these, I found as a guide, but other Jewish Israeli guides too, the way these things can be marked out is not through theological explanations, which often go over the head of, of many of, of the pilgrims, but rather through ritual. So here, right, very rare, very unusual, and only one case of actually a Jewish guide going in and immersing people in the Jordan, but that's, that's very exceptional. You see here the spaces are then, right, nature spaces, and people will pray outside, including, right, a kind of meditation for service here in the synagogue of Masada. And um, so in today, I would say very often people come for Christian pilgrimage, but Christian pilgrimage also has an element of, of interreligious encounter as well. Let me close just by relating kind of one, one little episode. Um, I would, um, as, as a guide, I would take people, um, I would read from the Bible and New Testament, or quote, and then after several days, the question would always be, so when did you discover Jesus? How did Christ appear to you? And um, when I explained, well, no, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not Christian, I'm Jewish, it's sort of, yeah, but, but you recognize our Lord, don't you? I mean, Jesus was, was Jewish. And I said, well, the way to do it was through, through, through ritual. So we went down to the Kotel, okay, and um, I, would, I took in my, my, my knapsack here, um, uh, my talit and tefillin, and I would put on, wrap myself in the talit and say the prayer, and wrap myself in the tefillin and say the prayer, and then translate it. And then you could see, ah, they looked at me, they looked at the, the people praying at the, at, the, at the Kotel, and somehow the coin dropped. And then they would say, after, so what do you Jews think about Jesus? Said, ah, that's progress. That's progress. Okay, and now I'm you Jews, right? Instead of you know one of you know a believer in Jesus. And after I did this for about five or ten times, I stopped and I said, you know, when I was a kid, I was 15 or 16 years old, and I grew up Orthodox, and I stopped wearing wearing tefillin. My father, you know, ranted at me. He said, you know. How come you don't wear your put on your tefillin? Your cousin Yankee wears tefillin, Yossi wears tefillin, I wear tefillin, only you, no good family. I said, I wouldn't put on tefillin for my father. I'm going to put on the tefillin for them? <laughs> so I stopped. And I said, well, if they don't get it, tough. You know, I'm, I'm not willing to go there. But I think I found that in my work as a guide that the, this playing the, the mediator, where one has to mediate not only um, the land and the geography, but Judaism, right, and right Christian sites as well, even if one divides up the authority, 
not only performatively places one <coughs> very often in a position where one needs to define and negotiate a position that's understood differently by different people, you know, in the group, but also creeps into the the um, the identity and the performance of, in my case, the Jewish guide and and others as well. Um, at one point when I was guiding intensively, I came home and, and my daughter was, was very small and I would recite for her, read, tell her every day uh, a story from the Tanakh. And this had gone for a long time and I had already gone, you know, from Breshit until the end of Sefer Melachim and Yemia. And I was really tad Abba, sapel sipur, tell me a story. Uh, well, uh, and when he came to Capernaum, Jesus came into Capernaum and he walked into the synagogue, you know, and I started to tell this story and after about a minute I just stopped. I said, Zil, that's enough for today. Said, but Abba, you didn't tell us the story. And I said, no, I, I don't want to tell this story. I, you know, if she wants, let her read the New Testament, you know, at age 18 or at age 25 or wherever. I don't want this to be one of daddy's bedtime stories and this way to give my authority to them, but reading out of the same book uh, Hebrew Bible and New Testament stories made that slippage into telling this story as if it were a Tanakh story very simple, very, very easy to do. And I find it in other ways too, with other guides I'd ask, so tell me, is it important for you to, to let the group know as a mediator that, that you're Jewish? He says, sure. They believe in Jews. Je they believe in Jesus. I believe in Moses. I said, you believe in Moses? <laughs> What the hell is that? <laughs> what do you believe in Moses in? But these are, 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 are formulas, or are ways of looking that when one is out working and spending months at a time, eight or ten hours a day or more guiding groups, then the performance affects the performer as well. And if it leaks into everyday life for the pilgrims, as it should, right, if it's a pilgrimage that has any effect when they get back home, it leaks into the lives of the performers, even of Jewish guides performing for Christian pilgrims, in spite of the structures that separate, I'm here for pilgrimage, I'm here to make a living from your pilgrimage, right? Still, these things right, slip over, and um, I think that a lot of the performance uh, very often we are far more performative creatures than we think and their performance um, gets under the skin and very often makes us uh, in terms of identity uh, who we are. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, uh, we're going to open the floor for questions. I think this was, um, you know. Can I get just three, five minutes to? Yeah, yeah, me? circulate. Okay. Uh, yeah. I want to just pass around some books Sim simply because, um, as I think the lone anthropologist presenting right, th this year, um, I want well, to, 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 yeah, that's okay. I want it, no, maybe, no, no. We've got Azri will present, maybe Elazar will present, but just to, I think some of the questions that arose, I think maybe of interest in your own works. I just want to, to really come and familiarize you with just a little bit of the literature. First of all, the book that I was telling you about, my book, is, is this one, right, that came out on the Jewish Guide. And the journal, let me pass this around to, I'm going to pass around a lot of stuff, Religion and Society, which I find is a very good forum that um, I would say is social science oriented without being um, as the, as, um, well, as deconstructionist of religious experience as some anthropology is, okay? It doesn't, you know, reduce it all to power structures. And I think anthropology of religion and pilgrimage in particular has gone in that direction anyway, and this is one sign of it, this, this particular journal. The other book, for those who don't know, bullshit, there is the, I think, what, for me, one of the, the main, you know, books, uh, things on pilgrimage is, is uh, Maurice Halbach's um, the legendary topography of Gospels in the Holy Land, which is available in, but in French has not been translated into English. It's in French and German. But you have here in this book a uh, collection on collective memory of Halbwachs, a kind of a summary or the last paragraph, the last chapter of Halbwachs' book. And if you're not familiar with it, you really should, you really, that one, you really should read that. Okay. Yes. I don't have here Turner's book with me, but it's called Image and Pilgrimage in Christian Culture, and you can find it in the library, it's important. But the main book that came out after Turner and that um, disputed 
Mm -hmm. uh, Turner's model of communitas, you know, we all get together in the pilgrimage and, you know, the other all becomes a brother and came back and said, yeah, but what are the different po power structures that influence pilgrimage and hierarchies is, is the main, there are a lot of them, but this is the first anthology. It's called Contesting the Sacred, the Anthropology of Pilgrimage. It, by the way, Turner's essay, uh, to the, Turner's article and the opening article of this book of Eden Salno um, are both translated into Hebrew and are in the book Aliyah La Regel by Universitat Ducha. Then some things that are just contemporary, okay? One of the problems that, you know, when you do in, his, in historical research, very often we're limited by what's, what's in the archives, and the archives often reflect uh, structures of power, uh, who's, what, what stuff gets, what stuff survives, what stuff gets written down, what gets silenced, right? Mm -hmm. right? Occasionally we get a Marjorie Kemp, but occasionally, right? Um, and in pilgrimage, in anthropology, I think one of the um, uh, limitations is that it's much easier to do anthropology in places and to talk to people who create the pilgrimage than it is to track down all the people who are actually on the road as pilgrims, mm -hmm. right? And, um, uh, and that is done less often, but here are two books that really do the job, I think, um, very in an exemplary way. The first one is called Walking Where Jesus Walked, American Christians in Holy Land Pilgrimage. I would say American women, American elderly or women Christians and Holy Land pilgrimage. And what she actually did was to follow the preparations of both evangelical and Catholic American groups. She's an Americanist. She comes out of the framework of studying American religion. And then to go back over a period of two, three years and try to track down people from three different groups traveling all over the United States to interview them on the long-term effects of their pilgrimage and to see how it relates to tendencies and trends in American religion and in, in gender roles, right, as well. So this is Hillary Kale's book. Uh, this one, um, uh, remarkable particularly for the, um, uh, the whole, but this is, deals with the pilgrimage to pilgrim stories on and off the road to Santiago de Compostela in, in Spain. And um, very much about, she spent several years right on the road and helping out in the hostel. And um, one of the, the great surprises in the book is that at the end of the book, she decides she's going to leave the academy, move to Spain, divorce her husband, get re remarry there, and live in Spain and along the road to Compostela. And so pilgrimage is a life-changing experience for the researcher as well. And a large amount of really of, of on-the-ground on interviews that were made possible also because of the nature of the road to Compostela, where there are hostels along the way and people have time. And you can hang out for people on the road for two or three hours and just talk with them because that's what there is to do, right? That or pray on, on the road. The other one is this one. What happens when pilgrims, right, or sort of pilgrims, or Bible students, take a long time getting there? This is um, a thesis, recent thesis, called Walking on the Pages of the Word of God, Self, Land, and Text Among Evangelical Volunteers in Jerusalem. And there's been a good deal that's written about Christian Zionists, um, uh, but most of it is, is very much politically oriented. In other words, who do they support? Uh, Jerry and Bibi is the name of one of the article, Jerry Falwell and Bibi, and to, to write, you know, about Christian support. And, and, and this really tries to get more in-depth study uh, by living here for a couple of years and going with them to their meetings, seeing what they do in daily life of uh, Christian Zionists living in Jerusalem. This is a collection called The Seductions of Pilgrimage. Okay? Uh, sacred Journeys of Far and Astray in the Western Religious Tradition. A little bit from all over, but uh, all of, almost all of it, um, well, all of it contemporary, and dealing with questions of um, how one stra not stays on the way, but strays from the road in pilgrimage and, and its effects. Off the derech. Uh, off the day, yeah, off the road. These two are books. This is these are fairly recent. Uh, called sharing the sacra, a little bit on the holy land, much on other stuff. 
What happens when places are shared by more than one religion, and how do they work? Is syncretism a term that can be used? Do people share just in different spaces and times? What happens when people perform, Muslims and Christians perform different rituals at the same site? Um, and a little bit on other sites as well. Is it necessarily, are religious places necessarily a place of conflict, right? Place, territory, it's mine, it's not yours. And here the argument is that they're, they're shared, and these are two recent collections. And the last, which is just one example, but I think is something that I've seen too little about is um, the study of uh, guidebooks that are there for Christian pilgrims. This is one of them that came out about 20 years ago by Bargill Pixner, Virgil, Virgil Pixner, Father Virgil Pixner, who was uh, in charge of the, um, uh, the church at Tabcha, mm. uh, and um, who writes this book not to study but for pilgrims to use while they're here in the Holy Land including a timeline that he's created. He's actually, he tempted to found a large number of new holy places around the, the, around the Sea of Galilee. Mm. A couple of which have caught on, little, put up little stones, monuments, uh, one at Corsi, one at other places, and even put a timeline down every day in Jesus' life. A little bit of, a little more than a little bit of speculation here, but wow. you, can, you can see wow. how uh, these, these things, as looking at these kind of Chromo guidebooks as devotional literature and asking them how they work. So, Zell. Wow. Um, food for learning, thought, and whatever. Um, Uri and you need to meet them then. So I, my question is this: uh, We're living in a, in a global world, and travel to the to the Holy Land has never been cheaper and safer. And I wonder whether that obscure is something that certainly was very strong and important in pre-modern uh, pilgrimage, and might still be important now, although it's uh, obscured by by the simplicity of the of the practice. Which is that uh, travelers to the Holy Land in, in, in the pre-modern world uh, created um, travel accounts, and in fact also guide books for people who have had no intention of ever making it to the Holy Land. Right. So I mean, not only in the sense of Marjorie Kemp that who created a form of religious literature that could be officiated in many contexts. But think about you know Felix Fabri, mm -hmm. who's writing a report for nuns mm -hmm. who who, are, who who can't make it ever to the Holy Land, and so one has to uh, appreciate the sense in which his own travel um, and anticipates this this uh, possibility of traveling to the Holy Land in a, in a completely mystical sense, and so. Um, the, the, the sort of um, practice, where there's a sense in which the stones, you know, the, the, the living stones or the not living stones, okay, are evocative of this um, it's a mystical experience in a way that is only possibly only mnemonic, so that the person who's reading these reports in, in Europe could experience that completely. So whether you're here or there is almost is almost the same. I wonder, I mean, experience it completely or not, right? The ones that experience it completely are going to tell us about it, right? Or write about it, perhaps. Yes, there, there certainly is you know, this question of both, um, I mean, what, I think what, I mean, what you're pointing to is that uh, how mobilities of people and information right, change the world, right? Um, there's much information available. One, you know, today one doesn't need Felix Fabli. One can go onto the internet and, and you know, and find whatever. And the the potential of people um, taking the the practice or what the, what they've read and uh, doing something with it at home and never coming to the Holy Land, right? At least in the West means well, you know, hey. I, you know, I'll start saving up my money. Maybe I'll go with the pastor or the priest next year, right? Rather than it, it being something that is uh, transposed to a, a um, uh, you know, to a, a mystical practice with the with the account, right? Um, I wonder if that says does that, I, I I think that says as much about the book 
and about our access to sources today as it does, perhaps equally well as it does, about the potentialities and the ease, the ease of travel. Um, you know, nevertheless, I mean, for, for in the 80s, there was the thought that um, with the diffusion of pictures and information on in the 80s and 90s on the web, uh, there was a real fear among scholars that both pilgrimage and tourism would become obsolete because people, it's, you can see the Mona Lisa much better on your screen than you can in the Louvre, even if there are no, uh, you know, gilets jaunes uh, to, to keep you from get, getting in on a Sunday. But, um, uh, but it hasn't happened. You know, these, you're right, these things have become today, to a large part, for a large number of people, ways of enhancing the experience to get one to uh, wetting the appetite of something that is possible, right? even if you have to save up for it. Um, and on the other hand, ways of reliving the experience that people might have done through, through the stone in some ways, through the relic, through the, um, well, later through the icon. Now for people to, to have the souvenir, have the picture, and to tell their stories, even on, on internet blogs, to other people. So I haven't answered you. I think I don't have an answer to your question, but I think there's there's both a continuity in the practice of preparation and follow up, even for pe you know to to transmit to other people who haven't been there, but certainly the the access of information and the ease of travel um, makes a difference, and it's much less likely that the primary purpose of any travel account right um, will be in order to be a, you know a meditative text for for prayer although you know pastors and priests write them and and um, and some pastors and priests make sure that they are live broadcast from Gethsemane into their places of worship on Sunday morning right in their home church you know so yeah mm -hmm. אני אומרת לי שמה שרציתי לשאול הוא די דומה למה שאורי אמר, אבל אני אנסה בכל זאת לנסח את זה באחרת אולי. דיברת על זה שהניתוק של יעל הרגל מצריכה הוא גם ספיריטואלי וגם פיזי. ואני באמת חשבתי על יעל הרגל מתן, פרקטיקה שאנחנו מכירים בימי הביניים באירופה, שלא רק לא דרשה ניתוק פיזי מהבית, אלא הרבה פעמים עשתה שימוש באלמנטים אה, פיזיים מהמרחב שבו עולה הרגל המנטליים שחיו על מנת אה, לעזור להם לעשות את העלייה לרגל הזו אה, למקומות הקדושים. ועוד דבר שחשבתי עליו בהקשר של... אה, אה, חשבתי על האסטרטגיות של עולי הרגל, אולי על אה, כתיבת המקומות הקדושים ועל האופן שבו עולי רגל, אני מדברת על ימי הביניים מנסים להתחבר במונחים של ביתי אל מה שהם מוצאים כאן. אז למשל, יש לנו תיאורים של עולי רגל שמגיעים ומספרים על האנסטזיס בכנסיית הקבר, שזה דומה לכנסייה לבית שלהם באכן. כאילו במקום אנחנו נוטים לראות את הכיוון ההפוך של איך אכן מעתיקה את ירושלים, אבל הם חושבים על זה ממש במונחים של הבית שלהם, או מגיעים לכנסיית הקבר ומסתכלים על כפלת אדם מתחת לכפלת הצליבה, ואומרים, אה, ah, כפלת אדם ממוקמת מתחת לכפלת הצליבה, כי בציורים שאני מכיר, גולגולת אדם מונחת מתחת לצלם, כאילו מין היפוך כזה של הדברים. I think I think that um, uh, yeah there, there's there's always the, there this interplay of you know quote original and reproduction and people who who there through you know reproduction grow up with I think that that's that's the the original um, I think of how you know to me there's a continuum there in the even in the fashioning of sacred space, very often in the image of people's expectations from abroad. I mean, Halbwax makes the point that it's, you know, it goes place, uh, identification, tradition, ritual, 
come back identify place. It's through the places that are, are marked in ritual that one then marks out the stations of the cross or, or the practices in Jerusalem as significant sacred practices, right? And the others kind of get don't get the attention because they're not they're they're not in the ritual. Um, and you know, undoubtedly, there's there's much of that in space. I mean, the the you know, look at the entrances and the way that the Crusader Church of the Holy Sepulcher, you know, was constructed, the cruciform church, right, or the additions onto the Byzantine church in, in Bethlehem in order to, you know, give it let's let's you know, let's make it cross like by putting the apses there on the side. And these are brought over, or more recently the garden tomb. The garden tomb is an English rock garden. And we'll find another tomb, we'll find it using the Palestine Exploration Foundation contour map that gives us the guide. Warren's shaft is the esophagus. The Bible says that the, uh, the, the, um, the um, uh, sacrifices were slain skew onto the, to the north of the altar, so it can't be the Holy Sepulchre because that's on the west. Let's look for a place to the north. Here's the body of Jesus. The esophagus is the Warren shaft, and then the head is the head of the skull. Voila, here's the garden tomb. Lo and behold, you, do, you, you dig and you find a tomb. Not so hard in these areas of, of, of near the wall in Jerusalem. And then you establish, you create, and you create a rock garden. Now, even it's it's then and people go and they worship there even if archaeological evidence you know says look if we have to pick the holy sepulcher you know is a is a 20 to 1 bet or more right but then they come back and they say well you know this feels right this is the place where jesus touched me or this is the place where i felt the spirit and so even if it is archaeologically more accurate, the Protestant pilgrim very often is disgusted by the Orientalism and the smells and bells of the Holy Sepulcher, and for him it's all wrong. There's no hill, there are no crows, there's no garden, there's nothing what they expect. So they said, yeah, well, that may be more accurate, but this is the place, this is where I felt Jesus touched me. So the garden tomb is then fashioned Right, in order for it to correspond with the expectations of the British and later other right Protestant pilgrim, and, and it works. And even later, or much later, now there's so some just finishing a thesis on the baptismal sites, the Yaldenit, the Jordan River, right? It looks like the kind of place where evangelicals go to be baptized. It's theatrical in terms of its structure. It's got the theater, it's got the place you can see them, it's got handrails going into the water, right? You can walk down. This is the kind of place where Jesus, a little fishy, he should have been baptized, right? And therefore they will prefer it over the Jordan the River site, whether it be on the Israeli or Jordanian side, which certainly have both tradition and archaeological evidence to support them, whereas the Jordan River, you know, Yaldenit has neither. But So you have this imposition of the image, right, onto the place. People go to Nazareth Village, which is a reconstructed village, and they worship there in the reconstructed synagogue, and if they don't have time, some evangelical groups will skip the church in Nazareth, because, yeah, it's, you know, it's this Catholic church anyway. Right? And we'll do their worship there in a reconstructed and heritage village. And that, that's their experience. Well, Jesus could have been here. Okay, so that's Nazareth. So it's in, in some ways, this wor these work in the same way in, in pilgrim and tourist imagination. Hey, oh, sorry, skip Dan. I wanted to ask a little bit about the personal ambiguity. Yeah. Uh, because on one hand, you're, you're playing a lot of different roles here. You were playing a lot of right. roles. Um, Trying to make a living, right? Doing, being a professional, right? Gathering material that you would use later, like in your, like I don't know if you knew then right. that you're going to become an academic and you know, anthropologist, whatever. Um, you used most of your talk, I would say, was was you, were, you did a very good job being respectful of your clients. Occasionally, the, the lack of respect sort of came in. Um, you're wearing the hat. On the tour guide of, of, the, of the Israeli, but not only Israeli, the Jewish Israeli, the Jewish Israeli who's not Christian, so you don't share with their mm -hmm. beliefs. Presumably, you don't share from your personal experience what you said the, the 
the beliefs of many other of, of religious Jewish Israelis. Um, is it just performance? How do you square the circle with all these different uh, roles that you were playing? And how do you avoid <coughs> this coming through to, to, to your clients? In a sense? Well, they're, 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 I think there, there's several different questions. One is, you know, is the performance, the performance is an academic or the performance is a guide? Okay. Both are performances in a certain sense, and both have their rules and, and their, their, you know, and if you like, and, and their payoffs. Right? Um, uh, let me answer your last question. How do you involve it for coming through to to the um, to, to to groups? Well, first of all, there there's a kind of a, a temporal separation, right? I very I very rarely guide today, right? And most of the material that's based on guiding was on things that I had done before I actually sat down to write the first article on, you know. But the interplay is always there because even when I was looking at uh, Second Temple Pilgrimage, right, then the questions that I was asking the material were questions that came from the Christian pilgrims and that brought their perspectives to the Second Temple material and asked different questions, say, than Safrai asked in his, his comprehensive you know, uh, work on, on the material. Um, so there was that and there was in part to, to kind of do a, a, uh, a cross-check by um, interviewing other guides and observing other groups so that I could say, well, this is based on personal experience, but it's not simply what Jackie Feldman does as a guide with his groups. Right, and to test them both through observing them, and then to having them read the material, and they say, you know, oh, that's 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 crap. You don't know what's really, you know, this is how we really do it. Right. Um, so, so that in terms of collecting information. Now, how do I do in terms in terms of the groups? Um, look, I I um, and and I, I think here we we certainly I and the and some of the religious guides. Religious, I mean let's say, Christian religious guide for a Christian group separate ways. Um, I'm convinced that um, you shouldn't lie, but God help you if you tell the whole truth. There's not a whole truth that, as you see it, that people want to know. Now, this applies to many, to, to, you know, to many uh, priests as well. Um, Last week, okay, not pilgrimage, I invited to my religion anthropology of religion class um, the uh, pr Catholic priest of the community here in, in Beersheba, Piotr Zelasko. And he told, the, he said, you know, I, of course, you know, I don't believe that, that you know, that, uh, uh, that, you know, God makes, you know, I, I'm believing Catholic, but I don't believe that, you know, God makes snakes talk. Or, or donkeys talk to people, and you know. And I told the people, you know, in, in a sermon that, that that I had about, you know, these are the ways that we need to read the Bible, and some of them were devastated. And I realized that, um, you know, for some they they need the literal word, and this is what. And I don't need to tell them you know, the truth as as I as I say as I see it. Um, there's a lot of, even within a group, there, there are a lot of very different levels. As a guide, there are some groups I know that are impossible for me, for me to guide, right? Or very hard, that's impossible. I remember in one particular group, a, a, it was a, a Bible, a, an evangelical Bible college from Ohio. And after the group, the, um, uh, the, pre, the, um, the dean of the college was in the group. He said, you know, you should come over. For, we have to bring over for a winter semester. You know, you have to teach our students, you know, about what you're teaching us the Bible. I said, you know, Jim, are you sure? I mean, you know, I, I'm not a Christian. He said, oh, come on, three weeks, the kids will never figure it out. <laughs> now, you can say, okay, this is the cynical end of the picture, all right? And it is. But there's a lot of that going on in performance, right? One gets into a performance, and for me, right, I don't become a Christian when I read um, the, you know, when I read the gospel or portion from the gospel to explain to it in, you know, in Capernaum. But, um, you know, 
when when I hear some of Jesus read of Jesus debates with the Pharisees I said man they're telling my high school rabbis off I wish I could do that so there is but it's not just telling off there's a place that I do identify and connect to the scripture and um, become kind of and arrive at that suspension of disbelief if not belief that I think is is necessary in order to um, to work effectively as a mediator between Christians and their their holy sites now it doesn't work for everyone and there are people who say you know oh, they pick up on the word on a particular word and they realize that this is a critical distance that they, they don't want to hear but that happens with with even with with seasoned pastors and priests there's a larger distance because I'm not of the faith whatever that means for different churches but there's enough room there so that it can work and there are passages where I know it can't work and I'm not going to read them I'm not going to go to the to the you know Via Dolorosa and read the Gospel of John for crucify him Cru you know there are places where you where you draw back and other different guides have different even strategies there are some for example that will never read a passage from the New Testament they'll go like this and say father would you like to have would you like to read or give it to one of the group there are others I found it was easier for me I would go on as a guide okay, not as a researcher to go on the bus and have two books with me to take a JPS translation of the, the Hebrew Bible and then to have a New Testament even though I can find in that Bible the same one I want to see them kind of me shifting books and that's a way of saying okay this is one book this is another I'm going to treat them right differently so there are various strategies that work and I think that um, for most I'd say myself and others it, when you it can overcome the the um, it allows you to suspend disbelief and if you become too if you really become too cynical about it then um, either you'll feel it and say I better do something else or if you're unfortunate your the pilgrims will feel it and will give you the message של פרוטסטנטים לאתרים הקתולים. Mm -hmm. רציתי לשאול אם נביא הדולורוזה יש איזושהי משמעות מיוחדת גם לפרוטסטנטים. Mm -hmm. והשאלה השנייה נוגעת למה שהראית לנו פה על המלכים שבאים להריץ את התינוק וכאילו ההפרדה שם. אמרת שזה לא סובניר אם אני... No, I think let me start with the second because it's very I, I think that the the, the distinct you know there may be uh, sanctif or or sanctioned doctrines about what constitutes a relic right by certain authorities of the church I doubt that that works when actually you get down and you see what people are what people venerate as relics and what they do with relics in the same way where you have you say okay we we'll go to the Kevel Kedoshim then we're supposed to pray to God to it but and some people will pray to Baba Sali it, you know you can have this come down but the, the line between what is a, the, what, what really is a relic in people's understanding right is is fluid and I think the line between a, just like between tourists and pilgrims between relics and religious souvenirs you know is fluid so you know there are things over on this spectrum like I, I have yet to find a church service that would consecrate the t-shirt that said my sister went to the Holy Land and all she brought me back was this lousy t-shirt but when you have an object like this um, uh, nativity set, right, then yes, it portrays a, a, a religion or a, a scriptural, for Christian scriptural event, 
And at the same time, it's not just a souvenir you place like, you know, Star of Bethlehem. There's a kind of gamut. So if you have a Star of Bethlehem, you put it on your Christmas tree. Does that imbue it with more sanctity? If you put it at the entrance to the, to, to the church as a large group, does that change that? The context changes the, the value of these things. And whether they're a souvenir or relic is never decided at one point. It's always in flux, right? As, as objects take on different values as, as commodities as they move, so to religious objects. I found, for example, that I, in one of the articles of this book, I, I speak about um, tips and, and commissions, right? And the ways that the moral value of tips and commissions can be changed through ritual. So, for example, if people are going to take up a tip for the guide, now the tip is seen as something that's not payment, but it's not religious, have no, it doesn't have religious value either. It's a kind of note of thanks for, for, mm -hmm. for service. It's more than that. But, um, but then the pastor can often say, you know, let's pray for Jackie and his family. And they'll pray and say, now I want us to take up a love offering. And they'll have a card and they'll write their verses, their, their blessings and their prayers and their verses and, you know, um, Isaiah 53, John chapter 2, and so on, right? John chapter 3. And then we'll wrap this blessing and pray together, right, for me, and then present, right, the object so that now this money has no longer become simply a tip, it's become a love offering, it's become gold, it's become imbued with religious value, because that's the same way you would take up a love offering to build a church, or to do a mission, you're now taking up a love offering for the guide's family, right, and you're going to bless him and pray for him. And then, so the money then becomes transferred and transformed in terms of what its moral values are. And some guys, as a result, when they come in, they realize that this money has been transferred. And sometimes they will use this money only for pleasure and not for, say, household expenses. Or more than that, they will come back, then go into the airport, go into the bathroom, rip up the card, right, and put the money in their pocket, flush it down the toilet, and put the money in their pocket as if to purify the money of its, of its Moral. M value as a kind of you know, invitation to engage in a theological discourse that might result in their conversion. So, so these, <coughs> these things change. I didn't answer your first question, but we can do that. Move on. Yeah. Daniela. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have a methodological question, maybe a question of an historian to the anthropologist, right. but it, it yeah. really bothered me lately with my own work. I think you began with uh, two quotations, uh, three actually, the Turners and Philo, right. one after the other. Right. Where is the emic etic discourse? Right. Is it first of all, is it out of fashion or? Um, but wait, I, I, I had, I had exactly. I felt like this for me posed a dilemma. I also, I very recently started with a, an anthropologist, and then with with uh, um, with Eliade, and, str and straight away I quoted even Taimi as saying the same thing. Right. Uh, you know, it struck. I, I was struck by how even Taimi and the 13th, this Muslim fundamentalist from the 13th century, thinks exactly like Eliade. But is it? Is I found it? I'm not sure. Is it methodologically problematic? What? What? Is I think it's perfectly legitimate. You know, if if let's say if pilgrimage beyond its differences, right, is is a human experience, and Philo presents it in this way. Right? Even if it's talking about Jews going to the temple, right? But he, you know, the temple is the whole world. If Turner presents it that way, and he does, right? He's talking about Christian pilgrimage, but when he puts out a definition, he's saying, "I want, you know, this is what I think that pilgrimage is about," right? Then both of them are trying to give a certain characterization of the the universal. They may be wrong. But of the you know universal aspects right of pilgrimage, they're offering that as a definition, and if they speak to each other across the generations, well, I think that's that's a wonderful conversation. Now others can come and as as the main thrust of Eden Salno did, and say, look, Victor Turner, you're talking about a certain kind of pilgrimage. You're really talking about marine pilgrimages. You're really talking about in certain cases, and look closely, and you'll see how much power politics and how much hierarchy you can find even in 
those pilgrimages that you you know that you praise and you see as 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 unifying, and then come back with individual cases and say, yeah, but you know in San Giovanni Rotondo it's not like that because there the priests and the 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 locals and the the you know and the priests from elsewhere at each other's throat over you know which is the true place of Padre Pio. Right? And others can come and deal with, you know, the political implications of you know the fact that, you know, pilgrimage is a place of as they call it, you know, contested contested discourse. But here, you know, they can they can you know they can hold their argument perhaps better with Turner because Turner is of their generation and then has been in the academic world you know adopted and spread more and perhaps in the theory that is closer to a little closer right to the terms that are current than than Philo. Philo you have to do a certain amount of translation not only from Greek to, in order to to see what he's talking about in interpretation but I think the conversation is is you know is is great if people can pick up, you know, Ibn Tamiya or Philo and use that in order to get a perspective on, on contemporary pilgrimage, I mean, for me it's like, you know, using the questions of, you know, little, little, you know, the lady from Bedfordshire to ask what went on in the Second Temple. They're her questions. And, you know, I, in this sense, I, I, I wouldn't worry all that much about this, you know, etic emic difference, and see just how wide they go and how applicable they are. You apply them, and if they don't apply, if they come out different, well, okay, what can I say then about that? About the, the divergence? Well, well, with any way of explaining that? I thought it was like that. I thought everybody gets together, right? And then, you know, he said, you know, and I said, well, look, no, here they don't. No, they don't. Right, and then Bowman comes along and said, "Yeah, but you know, even if they're different religions, look, you know, they can share the same place. Let's see how that's done." So I, I don't see it as, as problematic. People will frame them in different ways. One will become a quote, and the other will be dispersed through it. But maybe it's just a question of a lack of courage in saying for many and saying, "Okay, let me analyze, you know, Christian pilgrimage through Philo of Alex to contemporary Christian pilgrimage through Philo of Alexandria." Why not? Nothing. Yes, I, I have one observation and one something like a more personal question. But the first is rather simple. You try to compare between the behavior of Catholic and Protestant pilgrims. Right. And uh, I just want to make a little observation. I did a lot of research in Italy. I had a lot of Italian friends. And one thing that struck me, and then I realized why, is that uh, most of them don't know anything about the Bible except people who really studied the Bible for, for prisons, but I mean, just the ordinary, educated individual who is an academic and embassy knows very little about the Bible. Now, uh, I realized that the reason for this is that they are Catholics. And in, uh, in Catholicism, the idea is that the priest interprets the Bible for you. Absolutely. You don't read it by yourself, you don't interpret it by yourself. Right. Now, in fact, that was one of the big uh, changes brought on by the Reformation, which said you should read the Bible by yourself. Uh, and of course, also in Protestantism, you have uh, different interpretations and so on. But the idea is that you can read it by yourself, uh, you can read it in translation, and so on and so on, which makes it very obvious why this is so different. Right. And it keeps being like this until today. I mean, the Catholic attitude toward the Bible is still like this, even now in the 21st century, that uh, people don't really want to read it by themselves. They're not really educated to do it. They learn very little about the Bible in schools. It's only coming much later, and so I'm not talking about Catholics, no Protestants. It's a different question. Now, as to the personal question, and this is a little bit, well, shall we say embarrassing, but could you, as a guide, and as a person who studies religious behavior, uh, what if you are a complete atheist, unbeliever? Unbeliever, I mean, not a Jew, yes, uh, compared to Christians, but let's say a Jewish unbeliever, a Jewish atheist. How would you do that? Would you put your phylacteries and so on in the cotton to show them that you are a Jew? Or, well, that's the question. Um. I think not. I was uncomfortable with it as it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? I got that, yeah. Because it's not only 
because the right there are um, I think all, you know all all performances to some extent right um, define one's identity. The identity is never given, and this performances are not simply an an expression of something, a system of beliefs or so that's already ingrained, and this is how one externalizes it. Right? Performances right create people, form people's identity. But some, but the performances certainly here of guiding are very much right interactive, and there it's a particular power situation, it's a particular interpersonal situation, and different people are going to project then different meanings onto it that are a result of what they understand Tfilin to be, the Western Wall to be, ritual to be, and what they who they perceive their guide to be, right? Um, I think that part of my discomfort was not only why am I doing, why am I, if you, let me be simple, why am I sucking up to my pilgrims in ways that I would not do to please my father for whom it really mattered, <laughs> right, right, but also in, in what it says about me through representation and saying, does it mean then when I want to create consciously, why am I using it, right? I'm using it in order to draw, primarily in order to draw a border, right, between myself and them that will enable me, without offending them, to get around this, or try to get around, it doesn't really work, you know, this constant, you know, missionizing and understanding of, you know, this, the sticky embrace, okay? So you're saying, here, don't sticky embrace me, here, here, I, I wear, you know, here's my toilet, you know, what, right? Um, phylactery really works in both those ways in, in English, right? As pushing off and right and then, um, and the discomfort is in part with my association of right symbols by almost by their nature are ambiguous. They have to be because in order for in order to be able to unite people in in communities where they don't think the same but they perform the same, right? What am I doing, I ask myself, through the tefillin? In some ways, I'm uniting myself to those people who are putting on tefillin, not for the tourists, but because it's shachris, because it's morning prayer, right? They're at the wall. And I'm saying, look, I belong to them, right? I don't belong to you, okay? But in doing so, what I'm saying, am I not saying, this is what real Jews do? But I don't every morning. I'm doing it for you. And this was part of the discomfort, and I think, okay, you know, no, no, yes, no, I think it would be more difficult if I were, it would be more difficult to do if I were atheist and saying, you know, if I thought this is all ridiculous, you know, there is no God, this is just, you know, some, if we're, if we're anti-religious, I think that there creates a, a great strain, and the performance then requires um, a kind of emotional work, right, that, uh, Hochschild talks about this, about stewardesses trying to, to, to show, you know, um, uh, empathy or almost loving care for their passengers and working on exercises to really make them feel it, not just as they're acting it, right? Now, one has different repertoire at one's disposal here as a guide, Jewish guide, Christian pilgrim than one has as the stewardess, right? This is a power situation, but I think it would be much harder, you know, to do. I don't think I would do it if I were, actually, if you thinking through, if I were atheist. And those who are really atheists, at some point, they feel that strain more. They feel, what am I doing selling this crap to all these, these idiots, you know? If they feel that they should really do something else, you know? And, and many do. They'll say, all right, now let me find another, another audience, mm -hmm. you know, or, or so. I think you have a different range of atheism. Just well. yes. I think you shouldn't just say, like, atheists are like this. You have to if they were committed, devoutly anti-religious, they're exactly. going to have a hard time doing this performance. Yeah, and, right. and they do, and they wind up, all right, let, let, me, let me take other people, let me take, take you know, German tourists on their seven-day Rundreise to show them, you know, culture and politics, and I don't have to, and I can talk about religion from a distance, and that's okay. Yeah. Um, what you said at the beginning, about 
אני על הרגל כיציאה מה... יציאה מה, 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 מהיום יום והטיסה מהוואי והחוסר היכרות והשילוט והתיווך איפה זה בא, האם ואיפה זה בא לידי ביטוי בעליות לרגל ישראליות? זאת אומרת אם מישהו מבאר שבע נוסע לירושלים או, או אפילו למירון או לבבא סאלי וזאת נסיעה של שעה והוא יכול לעשות את זה ברכב שלו והוא מכיר את השפה וגם אם הוא בוחר להיות שם במשך שלושה ימים, זו בחירה שלו, וזאת לא היית... האם, האם ואיך זה בא לידי ביטוי בעליות לרגל I think that almost, you know, that today at least, by definition, all these, these pilgrimages, Turner writes about this, are always have a tension very often between the voluntary and the obligatory. Even in religions where, or religious periods, where it's seen as obligatory, um, It's much, it's, it's much easier not to do Hajj than not to pray, you know. There, there, there are exempt, more exemptions. In Bayit Shini, everyone is supposed to go, but most people didn't, right? So there's always, and same Baba Sai, there's always this tension between the voluntary and the obligatory. You, you, you take upon yourself, right, to be a pilgrim in most, in the vast majority of cases. You're right, the road, when you go, I'm going to go, what, next month? Right, to, from here to Nitivot for the Hilula of the Baba Sali, right, the road won't be significant. As a matter of fact, we, there's a recognition that, enough of a recognition that the road won't be significant that, right, that Effie and others said, let's do, let's do our, our introductory lectures here before we get on the bus because we can't do it on the road. There isn't really a road, right? It's, you know, half hour and, you know, and we're there. So this mipum tsara agra, that the, 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 the idea is, is not universal. And actually, I was surprised to find when I, back then, literature of Bayit Sheni, that there, it isn't anywhere. There's no mention of it among all the little snippets that we have about pilgrimage that says, you know, if you come from, from Yemen, as people did, right, or from Babel, from Babylon, that your, your, your reward is greater than if you live in the upper city and you, you know, in the you go, go down to the temple. So I think the value of the road is not universal, right? And in the Turners, they emphasize it because their starting point was, was the Christian pilgrimage and was the tribal right, uh, uh, rites of passage in tribal societies, right? And here's where one can go and say, you know, when you look, answered your question of, you know, how you use the paradigm and you can say, yeah, but Philo was coming from Alexandria. He came once in his lifetime. Would he have written the same way if he lived, if he was a Kohen living in the upper city of Jerusalem? Well, no. And if you look at Philo's image of Jerusalem description, right? And you look, say, at Tosefta Menachot that talks about, you know, the, the, the priests, you know, oili mi beit baitos, oili mi beit katros, you know, for all these people, because, you know, their treasurers and their sons are secretaries and their sons-in-law are, you know, are, are scribes and, and they go out and beat the people with, with staffs if they don't come, out with their, come up with their tithes. You can see that these are people who looked at the priests probably from close and very different ways ways than Philo did, who didn't know what was happening behind the scenes, and neither does the pilgrim, and neither perhaps should he know what goes on behind the scenes. Someone who goes, if, if saying this truth, or you know, what you tell truth, not don't tell them the whole truth. See, if someone takes a group of pilgrims saying, listen, let me tell you what happens behind the scenes. Do you know what that ladder is doing there? Do you know how many chairs were broken over the heads of other people? You know, the Syrians broke, the Armenians broke over the heads of the Greek Orthodox priests, you know, last, last Easter Sunday because they spent, walked over the line. Why, you know, yes, it's part of the truth of the, of the Holy Sepulchre, but you know, is this... Is that what you want to present to pilgrims? Is that important in what they've come for? So you adjust in what they've come for, and you adjust in ways that, that are different in different situations, in the same way that, if they say about cynical, in the same way of what I present to a class in terms of, say, anthropology of religion or collective memory, is not what I want to present, what, if, I'm, if I'm wearing the guide hat, what I want to present to the pilgrims there. Certainly not in the same doses. Because you don't want them to, de to start off by deconstructing their experience and making it, for example, into a question of political power. 
if they're there and they're interested, okay, and maybe one or two people are interested and the rest of the group just wants to say, hey, this is the place where Jesus rose from the dead. That's why I'm here. Okay, I'm glad that the people at the garden tomb are doing, the, you know, when I'm a guide, that they're doing the guiding by themselves. I would have a hard time. Are you an easy time with Jesus rising from the dead? No, but I, but I don't have to, I don't have to say, you know, you know, and here is where Jesus rose from the dead. I can simply, you know, either or not read the passage, or say there are other guides with other techniques. Say tradition says that, and then there are others who there 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 are pastors or priests who object to that, and say, you know, Southern Baptists, says, I don't want to hear. I don't want to go where Jesus wasn't. I want to go where Jesus was because there's this, you know, <laughs> how much how authentic are the places? But there are ways of simply you don't have to say everything. And if the priest, or I, the, I was thinking yeah, of the rising from the dead. Not I don't have to say, right? You know, if Jesus rose. You know, I don't have to say. And here is where Jesus rose from the dead, and be committed to it. Nor do the most the the, the situation um, necessarily demand that from me. I can say, you know, he, what? How? How? How it is not demanded. Oh, you can say, this is where the church says. This is where Christians believe that. This is the site associated with. Now, of course, the people, the believer, will hear that as he hears that, right? But it doesn't mean that I'm giving, you know, a testimony of faith. Yes, are they, is there this penumbra where what you say is understood differently? Certainly, inevitably, right? But there's a price, a payoff as well for the, the um, for creating very explicitly the distance, right? And that price, I think, other, you know, as a guide thinking, a cap, but and say, uh, others will think differently and say, no, no, it's important for me, what's important for them to get is where, you know, their guide stands. But the people haven't come to hear first and foremost what does their Jewish Israeli guide believe about X, about Jesus rising from the dead. But first of all, where does Jesus rise from the dead? Yeah, but they, yeah. they have something about the Israeli Jewish guide. Right. The new people, he is an old Jew, right. a new Jew. Right. I mean, you are coming in front of them. Right. You are participating in a secularized Christian journey. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if yeah. you have to call it pilgrimage, because what I have in mind is the Tiule Molet, okay. the, 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 which is almost the same. In many ways. Of course, yeah. without the, all, the New right. Testament, only with the Bible. Mm -hmm. So you take the Zionist new Jew with the Bible, which is of course different than the Jew who will come to these places, not only with the Bible, not for us to do Right. So you're coming, tell them I take only the Old Testament, but then right. something right. else. Right. Then telling them, okay, the feeling is maybe something else. There is a question how each group receives the right. Jews of today. Right. Because the, the main question is what is our historical perception? Right. And you distinguish yourself from the other Christians. Right. In that sense, you distinguish yourself from your, I mean, from from the two, but I don't see, I, I still think, I mean, okay, I don't right. blame, yes, I mean, uh, but if I try to analyze right. what you are doing there, I think, and what does it mean, what it tells us about these Protestant pilgrimages, okay, uh, tools to the Holy Land, right. because pilgrimage without the, the main site that make a pilgrimage, a pilgrimage, is something in where indeed to read him and, and call it religious, cultural, whatever, biblical uh, aspects are, uh, are mentioned. And then you are coming there. And you don't also, you don't, <coughs> and they are think anyway that the Old Testament is the price of grace. And so what will be the alternative that you allegedly give them? I understand, okay, you don't want, you, you, you will not say this is where Jesus uh, 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 
was resurrected. This is not even where Jesus is both is is this is not Jesus grave, you can see. This is where the church in which people say, I mean, whatever. But paradoxically, what is interesting in this sense is the notion of secularization. And when you said atheist, you made it even clear to me because atheist here is a Christian category. I'm, I'm going to have it's to stop. It's not something else. It's within the line. It's, I do not believe in the Bible. Okay. We didn't go into... We need to unpack the atheist and go into depth. I would say, to, for me, it's if someone is 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 devoutly anti-religious and thinks that it's all a bunch of crap, then he's going to have a hard time performing, right, for himself and for others, without going into the question of exactly what is atheism and secularization. Yes. Okay, okay but, but no, 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 no. wait, yes. Guys, we've got to stop yes. because there's... There, the there, the, the, the reading, the yeah. reading yeah. even of the Hebrew Bible, no, right, is, becomes encompassed within a Christian pilgrimage. So that is seen, right? Doesn't matter what I do, then then I will be seen as the initially as the biblical Hebrew, right? Who's reading, and the biblical Hebrew was followed by the New Testament Israel, okay? But there are all kinds of ways of that are not made explicit of denaturalizing the text and making the listener feel this is not quite my home that I'm comfortable with, place that I'm comfortable with, and yet somehow it's related. And that's the beginning. You know? Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks.